Between 1901 and 2023, uh, the Nobel Prize, well, it's been awarded, what, 621 times to 1,000 people and organizations. That's according to the Nobel Foundation. And among these winners is South Korea's only winner thus far, President Kim Dae-jung. He was awarded the 2000 Nobel Peace Prize. And maybe uh, you out there are wondering, or maybe you dream of becoming the second person from Korea to do so. But the question is this, what does it take to become a Nobel Prize laureate? Is there a secret behind that success? Where does it begin? Well, to help us answer some of these questions, we have invited Dr. Brian Keating, a cosmologist, author, podcast host, and distinguished professor of physics at the University of California, San Diego. UC San Diego, let's say hi to him right now. Hi, welcome to our program. Ah, <laughs> yes, it is indeed a good morning for us. But uh, yes, um, I want to ask you this first. You know, for your book, uh, the English title, Into the Impossible in Korean, it's 물리학자는 두뇌를 믿지 않는다. So in this book, uh, I hear you had the opportunity to, to speak with Nobel Prize winners. And so um, what was that experience like? And maybe you uh, gleaned some insight after you spoke with them, what did you uh, see and hear? Yes, I wanted to create a self-help guide for scientists and engineers and technically minded people. That's what I do as a physicist. And it ties in nicely to your epitaph question because this is Alfred Nobel's epitaph. He was the richest man at the time of his death in 1896 uh, who had ever lived. He invented dynamite and he wanted to redeem his name so that he wasn't known as the merchant of death. So these incredible intellectuals, peacemakers, authors, artists, and doctors, they do incredible good. And I wanted to share their knowledge, but not only their knowledge, I want to share their wisdom. And so this book is really written as a tribute and a self-help guide to share the kind of challenges, the journeys, the ups, downs, joys, sorrows that accompany any great quest. And science, despite well, the way it's portrayed is really a grand story, a great quest to unlock the mysteries of the universe. So interviewing these laureates, I interviewed nine for this book. Mm -hmm. And I'm, uh, I'm pleased to say that I came away with a newfound respect, not only for their wisdom, but for their humility, which is oh. something I didn't expect. Yes, because you would you would think, you know, uh, people at the top of their respective fields, you know, uh, becoming world renowned after obviously winning the Nobel. I mean, but humility, that's really interesting, Dr. Keating. And, you know, the literal translation for the Korean title of your book is um, the English title is Into the Impossible. Korean title translated back into English, Physici physicists don't trust their own brains. Um, so is this true? Uh, and <laughs> Were you able to find any common thread among these amazing, really, really, you know, highly intelligent people? No, and your wonderful producer contacted me and sent me that question. I thought maybe uh, she had made a typo and that <laughs> physicists don't trust the Brian's. And that makes more sense to me. Because <laughs> you're uh, trying to have brain. <laughs> Physicists yes. only have their brains, so uh, it's 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 kind of curious. Although it is always good to n always check your assumptions as a scientist. Once you win a Nobel Prize, you think you're on top of the world, you can do no wrong. Uh -huh. That's when you're liable to fall into a trap called confirmation bias, mm. where you essentially think that there's evidence that only supports what you claimed uh, in your discovery. And the higher you get, the more accolades you get, the honors that you achieve, the the more this confirmation bias can take over. So a very famous physicist named Richard Feynman, second only maybe to Albert Einstein mm -hmm. in terms of uh, his abilities and his revered nature in science and outside of science, he said the, that the first rule is you should not fool yourself. And the second rule is you should assume you're the biggest fool there is. So in a sense, maybe it's right. We shouldn't trust our our brains all that much. Be oh. careful because you might be led astray. Oh, interesting. So, um, uh, you know, in their attitudes towards life in general, um, because in your book you mentioned that they pursue things like, you know, that things that make them curious and really enjoy learning. Um, is this a common thread uh, among uh, the nine laureates that you interviewed? 
Yeah, absolutely. The the main takeaway was curiosity, and the second uh, you know kind of takeaway that I got is that they suffered from something called the imposter syndrome, which is the sensation that you're not as good as people think you are. And some of them, including my good friend who wrote the foreword to the book in English, Barry Barish, who won the Nobel Prize for detecting two black holes a billion light years away that slam together near the speed of light. <laughs> uh, this man, you'd think he'd be, you know, so full of himself. He said, I had the imposter syndrome worse than ever after I won the Nobel Prize, oh. because when you win it, you get a million dollars and you have to sign a logbook when they give you the golden medal that you have to wear. And you sign this logbook, and he looked at the pages that came, people that came before him uh, years ago. He saw Richard Feynman, Marie mm, Curie, mm. and then he saw Albert Einstein. He said, I don't belong in the same breath wow. as Albert Einstein, let alone the same book. So I helped him get over it. I told him Albert Einstein considered himself to be an imposter as well. He thought of himself as a swindler and that he was no good compared to Isaac Newton. And <laughs> Newton uh, thought he was no good compared to Jesus Christ. Uh, so it goes on and on. But that was a key lesson, curiosity. Yes. And humility. Those are the two key traits. Yes, yes. Uh, I hear you have another book where you, uh, you know, criticize the Nobel Prize system itself. So I'm really curious about this. Can you elaborate? Yeah, so I had created an experiment in uh, 20 years ago now that was setting out to understand what put the bang in the big bang. Yes. What caused the universe to begin expanding? Mm -hmm. And this is an experiment that I invented. And then eventually we claim that we did just that, that we discovered the, the source, the spark that ignited this huge, biggest explosion that there could ever be. Right. And yet eventually we were disproven effectively that oh. we had come forward to prematurely. And actually it was uh, microscopic grains of dust. They were actually these micrometeorites like I have here if you're watching. Mm. Uh, little tiny grains. I, I give these away on my website, briankeating.com. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is what we saw. We didn't see the explosion of the Big Bang. We saw the shrapnel in the form of, of meteorites, basically, in the, mm. in the inter, inter, interstellar medium. So we had to retract it. And when that happened, if you can imagine, at that time, people were considering, you know, people uh, such as myself to be eligible for the Nobel Prize. And then it was snatched away. <gasps> so... Oh. I ended up losing it, and that's the title of my first book, is Losing the Nobel Prize. But mm -hmm. along the way, with interviews with Loma Laureates, I came to see that there were many, many criticisms of the Nobel Prize. Um, you already highlighted one. I mean, uh, South Korea is one of the most uh, preeminent science, technology, engineering, math um, uh, powerhouses around the world. And yet, and yet, you have zero Nobel Laureates in chemistry, math, physiology, medicine, and physics. So right. that's a that's a scandal in my in my opinion. So mm -hmm. all the things that all the technology, these could easily have done it. So why don't South Koreans win? Well, I partially explore that in that it typically goes to countries that have already won it. So the oh. rich get richer, the poor stay poor, and many people, and especially women and minorities, they get locked out and prevented oftentimes from winning the Nobel Prize. Wow. It's so fascinating to hear like the ins and outs and like the behind the scenes stories of the system itself. Because what do we know? We just basically, you know, every year, uh, you know, as a, a broadcaster, we, we get the list, you know, for each category yeah. one by one, and then we go, ooh, and ah, but we don't get the, the behind the scenes stories. Um, so for you right now, uh, Dr. Heating, uh, how do you stay motivated to continue to do what you do and to, you know, you know stay with it, uh, be current in uh, the world of physics? Well, I really still have this desire that I've had since I was a little boy to gaze up at the universe, to understand cosmologically, astrophysically, where did we come from? I think it's the most interesting question. You know, usually you ask somebody, what's your favorite day on the calendar? They'll say their birthday. I want to watch and see what happened on the universe's birthday. What could be more exciting than that? <laughs> Except perhaps what you do and you get to rub shoulders with the, the latest and greatest um, <laughs> news. But for me, that's what I love to do. My yes. kids love it. And it's always fascinating. You never meet someone who says, oh, I hate that uh, constellation because it's a Republican back constellation or a Democratic. <laughs> con People love uh, astronomy and I love it even more. The more I learn, the more I love. Mm -mm. So um, going back to my intro, like, is there a secret to becoming a winner? I mean, because I would assume that even to be on that short list of your the, the respective categories or fields that it's an honor, of course, to make the short list. But like, how do you get to get yourself out there? Like, do you have to promote your work and your research and your studies? Is it about like, you know, you know, going to, uh, you know, 
those conferences and hobnobbing with, you know, world esteemed,、uh, you know, scientists and whatnot. How do you get your work to be read and understood and get the spotlight? Yeah, it's a tricky question. I tell people that you know most scientists have a reputation for being extremely introverted, not used to explaining what they do or talking about what they do. There's an old joke that goes, "How do you know when a scientist is outgoing? Because he looks at your shoes when he talks to you." <laughs> and I, I wanted to kind of break、yes. that mold and and write the book not just for scientists. This was、mm. a book for someone who's selling you know Kias and Hyundai's, and <laughs> this is a book. For everybody, because oftentimes you have to have a very, very powerful trait called storytelling,、mm. and to be able to be a good storyteller will serve you well whether you sell cars, shoes, or you sell science. Because what you have to do is motivate people to get a great team. Nobody goes to Stockholm to get the Nobel Prize by themselves. Okay, so you have to motivate teams. You have to secure funding. You have to,、um, uh, you know, kind of build up technology. And instruments and travel all around the world. One of my telescopes, the highest one in the world, the seventeen thousand feet above sea level.、Mm -hmm. And these are not things you can do by yourself. You have to convince people. And for me, that means telling a story、oh. and convincing people that your dreams are their dreams and their dreams are your dreams. And only then can you cultivate this curiosity and resilience and convert it from just pure passion into true discovery.